Um, I want to jump right into our guest today, Jude Connolly Zimmerman. She's the founder of Jude Connolly, an American-made women's lifestyle brand known for vibrant prints and effortless styles. She was raised in upstate New York, and she attended the Fashion Institute of Technology, although I don't think you ever graduated, right? <laughs> See? You can be very successful without having an FIT graduate graduation. I, I did not say that. Did not say that. All right, so she spent 20 years in fashion sales and marketing, uh, working with uh, designers such as Tom Ford, Chris Birch, um, James Bradbeer, who successfully uh, rebranded Lily Pulitzer. Um, after 9-11, she decided that she wanted to change gears, and she decided to open her own store. And then later on, she decided to open her own brand. She was very interested in developing clothes that uh, fit uh, every body type, and that was really women-specific, uh, something that we'll talk about today. She now has two stores, uh, two, one in New Jersey, one in Charleston. She has a very uh, successful online store, and she does business uh, throughout the country in specialty retailers. So we're very excited to have Jude back to FIT after a few years, right? So welcome. And full disclosure, I'm doing work for Jude Connolly right now, so I get to spend a lot of time with Jude these days. <laughs> yes. Hello. <laughs> so welcome. Thank you. This is super exciting. <laughs> this is what I'm doing when I'm not at your office. Got it. I okay. love it. All right. I love it. <laughs> so we always start with just sort of asking questions a little bit about your journey. Um, I know it did involve FIT a little bit, but why don't you kind of take us through what led you to New York City and how you sort of got involved in the fashion industry. Awesome. Okay. So first I'm going to always say I love to, sp I love to talk, but I'm always nervous. So that makes it real and sort of keeps it real. So be kind. <laughs> and I'll, I, my expectation is to just share my story with you guys and maybe you'll get something from it. Maybe you won't, but here it is. So how did I find myself uh, in New York City? Funny thing is, I'm 55, married, divorced with two children, love my life, and I'm grateful for every day that I've had. Fifth grade, I was um, asked, or my family went to New York City on a, uh, a bus trip with a good friend, and we went to a show at Radio City called Auntie Mame. And if you've ever seen Auntie Mame, you'll understand me and my life. I saw this woman in front of me whose life was glamorous and colorful and fashionable and beautiful. And I thought, I want to be her. How do I do that? And the film was um, made in the 50s, but it depicted a woman in the, in the 1920s. And she lived on Sutton Place. She was an incredible woman. And the only prerequisite for me being able to leave that day of fifth grade, in fifth grade was my teacher said, you have to come back and write a book report about your day in New York City. That was probably the best advice any teacher had ever given me because I was able to sit and reflect on my day in New York City and what a day it was. It literally was, it changed my life. Uh, I, the excitement of the show and the play and New York City and the lights and the people and the energy, I knew from that day in fifth grade, 12 years old, I needed to be in New York City. And that really set the course for where I am today. So it came, so I went to high school and that was great and fun, but there was this junior year in high school, you know, the teacher said, what are you gonna, or my parents, the teachers, the guidance counselors, what do you wanna do for the rest of your life? Well, I had no idea. I wasn't a good student, uh, but I was a good talker and I loved people and I'm in the middle of seven children. So I thought, well, I love color, I love print, I love flowers, I love nature. And I said to my guidance counselor, what can I do? And, and I like to paint. And she said, what about interior design? Perfect. So the other, the other prerequisite I had was my parents said to me, because we live in New York State and you're one of seven, you have, to, you have to pick a college that's a state school. So lo and behold, I set out to go to FIT. And I thought, well, it's a, 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 a crapshoot. I don't know if I'm a, an artist. I don't know if I'm creative. I don't, I don't know if I'm academic. But I somehow miraculously got into the Fashion Institute and the Interior Design Program. I was blown away. And this was 1981. So do some math. But I, I came to the school. It was incredibly hard. It was fascinating. It was wonderful. And I, I, I studied for a year, and then I, I wasn't able to keep up with the studies. So I um, 
I didn't come back, and I went the second, my second year uh, in college, I went to the community college by my home. And at that point, I had met so many wonderful people at the Fashion Institute, all my friends said, come back to New York City. And in the early 80s, there were lots of jobs in the apparel industry, lots. I mean, it was so abundant. So I said, well, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I had worked in retail in high school, which was another incredible uh, moment in my life. So my friends had said, come back to New York City, we'll find you a job, literally, we'll find you a job. And they did, so I started out working uh, for an apparel company as a salesperson and what they call retail coordinator. So I worked as a salesperson at Bloomingdale's, representing a line of clothing that was um, sold at Bloomingdale's. And my job was to literally just go back and report to the, the boss, what's going on with that line of clothing, who's buying it and how's it selling. So there was my opportunity for my gift of gab. And I learned how to gather information and bring it to the people who could use that information. I had no idea if it was valuable information or not. But, it, but, but, the, but the company loved the fact that I had information, whether it was talking about a button that the customer responded to, or the stitching on the, on the jean, or the cut of the dress, or the color that the woman loved when she came out of the fitting room. So those are all those small little details that I didn't know I was capturing, but I was capturing it all. And the more they liked, the more, they, the more I shared with the people that I was working with, the more I took in more and more. So I, I learned very quickly how my, my eye was going to help me in my future. Did you recognize at any point that you were good at that or did you have to hear that from somebody else? Well, it's kind of like the gold star. We all like a gold star, right? <laughs> so you don't really know that, but when you're in it, but I, the, my, my person is, I, I want to please. I'm a, big, big pleaser, and I, I have a, a, a real desire to uh, m make people feel good. So when I was getting recognized, I just kept bringing them more and more information, and so I didn't really know what I was doing and why it felt so good. You don't think about you know, doing it again because it made you feel good. You just do it. So um, I, I wasn't really aware that I was a good communicator and that I had a good attention for detail. Mm -hmm. But, it, but it, it, in retrospect, it got me to the next level of my career. I mean, we'll get to this later, but you, in that sort of period of time, really started to learn what product was and how product is made and why people respond to that product. Were there certain things, even back then, early on, that you can remember that just intuiting what women wanted and how they were shopping and, and sort of how that may have affected you later on in life? So. It's a, it's such a good question, and again, you're you're such you're it's such an incredible time in your lives. So much is ahead of all for you. Um, so here I was, 16, middle kid again. Got to remember, your place in your family means so much. So a middle child, extra cash, extra money is not free flowing. So I, at a very early age, wanted to figure out a way to make money, so I could you know go out with my friends and and um, have some extra money. So I. Again, the gift of gab got me to a point where I was able to uh, get hired at a company. This is in the 70s when blue jeans weren't really worn by women a lot. I know I sound like a dinosaur for Christ's sakes, but that's true. So this, this store, it was an army and navy shop that sold men's clothes. They decided to bring in a women's department and bring in women's jeans. So they had to find somebody who could sell these blue jeans to girls. And I was always a tomboy. I have four brothers, loved my brothers much better than my sisters, and I wanted to dress like them. And, and, and so the, the people at this Army and Navy store, they hired me, and I had this experience with this young gal. Her mother brought her in and said to me, my daughter, and she was a, she was a bigger girl, stocky and a little bit chunky, and she says to me, find some jeans for my daughter. She's fat, and she wants girls' jeans they're never gonna fit her, because all girls are skinny. Well, that left such an impression on me, I thought, the poor girl. So, the jeans were cut for young girls, and t there were like six different brands. There was um, Jordache, and all the different types of jeans when they first came out, designer jeans, but there was a brand called Chick, Chick Jeans, and they were made for bigger girls. And it took us about two hours, but we finally found a pair of jeans, and this girl, she was 14, I was 16 at the time, she came out of the fitting room, and she had tears in her eyes, and 
I said, you look beautiful. And she, she cried and she said, I feel beautiful. And that was it. I hugged her. She hugged me. That was another epiphany I had in my life. I knew that that was my purpose, to be kind and help women find clothes that made them feel good about themselves. So no matter what we say, we all want to feel good and we all have to wear clothes. And that's what I always say. <laughs> you have to wear something. I mean, you don't, but I don't know, you know, I don't know if you do well in society without wearing clothes, but it, it, clothes really do make you feel something. And so my, my goal is always to um, do the best I can to dress women uh, in clothing that makes them feel comfortable. Because if you're comfortable, you really, I feel like you can do anything. So when did you go from, hey, your friends hooked you up with a job to like, hey, I could work in this industry and I'm actually quite good at it and started looking for other jobs and maybe talk a little bit about what those jobs were. So, um, so when I got in, when I came back to New York and I had this sort of retail coordinator job, I, I was great at communicating. So the, the company said to me, you know, why don't you go into sales? And I said, okay, what does it entail? And now one of the things too, I would say about never graduating from the fashion institute or anywhere, I held a big burden and it was sort of a secret that I, I felt less than anyone in the industry or less than anybody because I wasn't a college graduate. So I would highly recommend graduating. <laughs> if you're here, do it. You'll n I've never met anyone in my years that has regretted having a college education or let alone a college degree. So that's just, it seems obvious, but there's a lot of people I know that never finished college. So that would be my small piece of advice. But um, I was really fortunate because, again, early 80s, there was jobs were abundant and the industry was thriving. And so many companies were looking for great salespeople. And so I was very fortunate. I got into sales and my boss said to me, OK, no one in the company can open up Lord & Taylor. If you want to solicit Lord & Taylor, figure it out and do it. So I called and, hey, you know, Lord and Taylor Buyer, would you like to come and see our clothing line, blah, blah, blah. Well, never, I never got anywhere. So I'd go to the store and I'd look at all the other companies and I'd look at the brands and I'd study the clothes, I'd study the price points. And then I'd go back the next week and I'd make a phone call and I'd say, I saw this line on your floor and the, the company I work for has something similar. But, and so I would leave these messages it took me six months, nine months, and then the buyer finally called the company and said, I'm interested. This girl doesn't stop calling me. I'm coming in to see this line. And sure enough, I opened the store, opened the account, and it became a very big account for the company. I learned as I went, which was great because the companies that hired me saw something in me that they wouldn't necessarily have seen in somebody who had a degree in fashion buying and merchandising. I was so willing to learn anything because I felt a little bit inferior to the people that did have that degree. So I was hungrier and I never said no to anything that was asked of me. And that's what I tell my sons. Always say yes, no matter what people ask of you when you're working for them, it, you never know where it will take you. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I had this reputation in the industry that I was a good salesperson because I was so hungry to please. So I started getting phone calls from other companies had said, hey, I hear you're a really good salesperson. Would you be interested in coming to work for us? So the next company I went to was a shirt company that was, um, it was a men's company doing men's shirts. They had a women's division doing women's shirts. So I was working there and they hired this new designer who was unknown and he was struggling and his name was Tom Ford. And this is, this is where life is so incredible because you never know who you're sitting next to and you never know who that person will become or is. So he and I struck up this great friendship and he was making seersucker clam diggers <laughs> and embroidered shirts with whales on it. And like, who wears that stuff? But they did and he, did so, he was so successful there but he was kind and he was sweet. And it was such an incredible exchange. And then he went on, this, it was like in 1985 and 86 that I worked with him. Then of course he went on to Gucci and the rest is history with him, but who would have known? He didn't, he wasn't Tom Ford. He was just a, a young guy out of um, design school looking for a job. So you never know. Eventually you ended up at Sigrid Olsen, which do, you, do any of you know Sigrid Olsen? Does that ring a bell? It's probably, they're probably a little young. Probably, yeah, Liz Claiborne maybe? 
Okay. So back in the 80s and early 90s, these were the big brands that really were very specific to women. And I don't think, other than maybe Ann Klein in the 70s, where there, was there really a woman who were mm -hmm. designing for women. So what led you to Sigrid Olsen? Because, it, I mean, that was the heyday in the 90s of that brand. Um, and, and it was kind of an era that mm -hmm. unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. But so what was happening is Liz Claiborne was the women's dress designer uh, in the 80s because women were going to work. So in the 70s, women weren't really working. 60s, they definitely weren't working. So 80s were becoming this like women hear me roar and Liz Claiborne started making clothing that were accessible to real women. And that's what started the sort of uh, better to bridge market. And then in the 90s, what was happening is more and more companies were figuring out how to manufacture clothing offshore and they could make a lot of goods fast. So there were new designers coming in that had learned from Liz Claiborne and one of them was this woman named Sigrid Olson. But she was an artist who was making prints and colorful prints. And she started making, putting her prints on fabric and then she had this lovely little business. So somebody in the company had heard about this person, Jude Connolly, that was a great salesperson and was very good at working with small boutiques and, sm and small stores. So they interviewed me and I got the job. So here I was at 28 years old and I was working with lots of stores and I, I had a 10 year career with them. And again, remember, I'm just a salesperson. I love what I do, talk to a lot of people, but I went from, a $10 million company as an account executive to when I left, it was 110 million. I was a senior vice president of sales and marketing and Liz Claiborne bought this company, Sigurd Olson, that I worked for. It, it was the first merge, it was the first acquisition that Liz Claiborne bought and they went on to buy 18 more brands. And I was sort of the guinea pig, they used me to figure out how to go on and buy 18 more brands and they, they consulted with me and had me sort of help them through the transition when they approached new designers. So not only was I exposed to sales and marketing, but business at such a degree that it catapulted me to a point where I had exposure to every part of the business, including design. And that's sort of how I got to this stage of my life. <laughs> Before we get there, though, I, I think it's, it's so often sell sort of gets relegated, I think, as its own thing. But, you know, I remember when Michael Kors was here a few years ago at FIT, and he said the number one thing you have to do is sell product. If you can't sell product, you shouldn't be a designer. Um, and I'm just curious, before we sort of jump into the next phase of your life, uh, how involved you were in the product at Sigurd Olsen in terms of your, your role as a salesperson and being able to bring that intel back to the office, to the design team. So, you know, often you see these designers and you think that life is wonderful and fabulous and all they do is shop for fabric and look at beautiful prints, and which you do, which is, which is a big part of it, but you have to understand who you're designing for. And if you don't have an audience, you have no business, right? You can make beautiful clothing, but if nobody wants to wear it, then you have nothing, right? So I always say, we're not, des we're not, try we're not designing a three-legged pan. And most people don't know what I mean when I say that, but if, if people wanted to wear a three-legged pant, we'd all be doing it. But everything has been designed thus far. So we're, we're not creating something from nothing. It's a recreation of what exists, but it's appealing to your demographic or who you want to dress. It could be yourself. And in most cases it is, but then there are other designers who want to do it for their muses. So it all just depends on what your passion is. But I think at the end of the day, you have to have a connection to the woman you want to dress or the man you want to dress or the kids you want to dress because you, you get so much from when you are talking to the consumer. So being in sales, when I worked with buyers, I got the feedback from not only them, but I also read uh, selling reports. So again, it, go, it all goes back to your communication skills. It's the single, I think, most important skill anyone can have. You can remember things, but if you don't have that sort of connection with your consumer, you might be making clothing that no one wants. And that happens all the time with designers, all the time. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into this a little bit deeper, but you also not only learned how to learn 
what the customer wanted, but you also learned the numbers. Oh, yeah. And I do think that that is something that, especially from a creative perspective, can be very scary when we start talking about your current career. Obviously, the numbers play a large role, but can you speak to that a little bit and sort of that process? Because you, I mean, it probably wasn't something you thought you were going to dive into Excel spreadsheets and Mm-mm. Jim Roy and... <laughs> no, but you know, it's, it's so funny because I think creatives have a very strong sense of the numbers. It's just whether you like them or not. And I think that, so I'm a visual person. For me, the numbers tell stories too. There's rhythms and there's patterns. So if you pay attention to that, you'll see the patterns and things, and that will also lead you to certain paths. And so while I didn't think I had a creative bone in my body, I thought I was this hardcore seller. What, it, what, what, what that part of my life allowed me to do was create this sort of mental muscle around math and numbers, and then I would bring all these statistical data. So example, that tape yarn sweater that we've done month over month over month continues to sell at a 15% sell-through rate at Bloomingdale's week over week over week. And therefore, I want more of those because if I'm going to be rewarded on my sales, then give me more of those. And reluctantly, this, the designer would say, Jesus, Jude, I am so sick of doing those dang tape yarn sweaters. Can I do something else? I said, sure, give me something else new, but don't not give me the tape yarn sweater because there's always a customer who doesn't have that. So there was always that balance between keep giving me the old, but give me something new too. So mm-hmm. it fed her creativity as well as the business side. And that's, it's everything is sort of, you gotta balance everything. In, but don't be afraid of numbers. They, they'll tell you the truth. So after 9-11, you sort of decided to kind of change your life. We can get into that as much as you want or not, but ultimately you ended up opening your own store. Um, why don't we start there? Cause I think that is interesting. I think that's sort of a dream that a lot of people have. Um, and it's, it can be really fun and <laughs> horrifying at the same time. Right. So maybe, let's talk, let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> so, uh, nine 11, you know, it ruined, I mean, it, it was devastating. And, uh, I live in a small community in New Jersey and six of our, uh, members lost their husbands. So that was devastating in and of itself. And one of them was a very dear friend of mine's husband. So that, that had a, a, a profound effect on my life. And so I made a conscious decision a month after 9-11 to walk away from a career that I loved and adored to stay home with my sons. And I thought to myself, what the hell am I going to do now? I'm 38. Okay, I'll be a stay-at-home mom. No, <laughs> not, not a good idea for me. <laughs> it was very, but I prayed and I thought, you know what, why don't I try opening up my own retail store, which wasn't a passion I had had ever before, but I, I loved working with women. So I thought, you know what, what better way to do that? There's a lot of women right now that are hurting and they're because of 9-11 and my little community needed something. So I was fortunate enough to be able to find a retail space. And I always have this attitude, what I don't know probably helps me because if I knew more, I probably wouldn't do what I do. And I have big, you know what, I don't, I'm not afraid of much. I'm a big risk taker. And so I rented this space, I invested some money into decorating this shop, and then I set out to build a beautiful shop that would help the six widows in town make sure that they had clothes to wear uh, for the events that were coming, that were taking place. It was insane, the invitations that these women were um, being invited to. And a lot of people were lost at that time. So I just wanted to be a friendly place where you could come and stop in and say hello. And my trademark was putting jelly beans on my counter. Uh, more people remember my shop from the jelly beans that their kids would say, can we go into that lady's shop where there's jelly beans on the counter? We like that. But um, I opened a shop and it was, it was rewarding to the nth degree and yet it was the hardest thing I've ever done. I, I had to scrape four floors off this floor just to get the junk off the floor so I could lay carpet. Mm-hmm. So there was, there, again, there's nothing I won't do or haven't done, but it's ex- not, you, you, nothing comes without extreme hard work. And the, probably the more successful people are, the harder they've worked. So I don't think there's an easy path to it. But everything from uh, going into New York and buying, that was just incredible because I could buy anything. If I had the money, I could carry any brand, anything in my retail store. But then all of a sudden I had all these brands. I'm like, 
<laughs> so I had to come up with a point of view, and I did, and I had wonderful women coming in, and I had another, you know, same exchange, a woman had a baby, and she was very overweight, but she was still beautiful, and I put her in an Eileen Fisher $650 outfit, and she said, I've never spent this kind of money, but I've never felt more beautiful. I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Again, just another moment in my life where I thought, this is what I'm here to do. So I did that for four years, and then I thought, there's gotta be more, because this town is so small and I need more. And so I, I was at a point where I said, I'm gonna close the shop, and then I'm gonna hope to figure out what I do next, because I want something bigger. So if I remember right, you were running a marathon. <laughs> And you had a, an epiphany yeah. for your next part of your career. So why don't you kind of run so, us through that? So again, <laughs> I, you know, I wanted more and I didn't know where that was going to lead me. And, and I, I, like I said, I'm a risk taker. So what I thought, I, you know, the store was kind of like, okay, it was really fun, but there's got to be more. And I remember when I was in New York and I was something big and now what am I? So I took up running because I'm in my head and I, so I, I, I don't have a job. My kids are in school. And I start running, and then I run in this half, it's a half marathon for marathoners. If there's any marathoners in there, they'd have my head if they said I was, if I said I was running a marathon, I was only doing 13 miles, <laughs> not 26. So I was doing the half marathon. And, uh, I, I, and this is the God's honest truth. And I talk to God a lot, whoever he is, or it is, but I do. And uh, I, I was, so I was running in this half marathon, and it was 92 degrees that day. And I was wanting to run under two hours, and I'm super competitive with myself. So I'm running and I'm running and running, and they cancel the time of the of the race. So now I can't watch the clock as I'm running, and I'm an hour in, and I wipe my brow and I wipe the time off my watch. I'm like, mm, what am I going to do now for the next hour? Because that's what I was focusing on was my time. So I said, God, put an idea in my head. What the hell am I going to do for the rest of my life? And give me something to think about for the next hour so I can get this damn race done. And oh, see a black. Everybody's running in their Lululemon. Literally, this was in 19 or uh, 2008. And a, a woman runs by, or 2009, a woman runs by me in this beautiful, colorful, printed skirt in a white T-shirt. And literally, with thousands of women, she runs by me. And my eyes lock on her, and I'm watching her, and I'm watching her, and she looks happy, and she's running effortlessly, and all the rest of us are in our black, and we're all just kind of <laughs> running. And she's like this little fawn. And I, and I go, I got it. I love being in my workout clothing, right? Who doesn't, wear, who doesn't love being in their, their workout clothes for so many reasons? I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going I'm to create a line of clothing that allows women to feel good, that makes you feel like you're in your workout clothes, but they're going to be fashionable. Instead of doing leggings, I'm going to do dresses, I'm going to do tops, I'm going to do pull-on pants, and I'm going to do it in color and print because that makes me happy. When I looked at her, I smiled versus all the rest of us in our heavy black. And that's what I did. Literally finished that race under two hours, and within a year, I shipped my first collection, and... It took off from there. It was insane. But you talk about a, a moment. Mm -hmm. So the story was incredible. Well, in that, you really took it to heart because the fabric that you used, uh, which you now call jute cloth, which is sort of your special take on this, um, is based on, well, why don't you t tell sort of what it's based on? Because it was so unique in the industry at the time. And it sort of feels kind of simple, stupid at this point, right? But yet it was it was very unique and, and stood out. So tell us a little about how that came about. So you all have the little wristlet we gave you, right? So that's the fabric we use. It's nylon spandex. So it's it's a new, it's, it's not a new fabrication, but it's a combination of nylon that is relatively a new fiber that is used in apparel. And spandex, of course, we all know spandex. So it's a combination. It is so durable. It doesn't wrinkle. It wears well. But, but the best part of it, it feels really nice to the touch. So it's sort of silky. It sort of drapes, it doesn't stick. Um, it sort of slips off the body. And there's an experience you have when you touch it. You, you, and and that's, that has played very well because when you put it on your body, a woman feels really good in it. She can feel sexy in it. She can feel comfy in it. She, any, oh, she, has, she has a lot of emotions around it. But also when somebody touches her wearing that dress, if they put, her, put a hand around her or they rub her back or they say, oh, 
and they have that experience of touching it too, it feels good to them as well. So there's this whole interaction and exchange that happens when you wear this fabric. And it takes color really beautifully. So, and it prints incredibly well. So we, how it all came to be was just remarkable. Literally, I thought, well, where am I gonna find all this fabric? I know nothing about production. I know nothing about design, but I know what I like. So I set out on 38th Street, much like you guys do, going into mood, going into those fabric stores. And I, I had worked on 7th Avenue for 20 years. I'd never walked into a fabric store, never. <laughs> and I just started touching all these bolts of fabric. And I just found this one that had a beautiful print on it. And I pulled the bolt out and, and then I saw it for another one, another one, another one. And then I was like, okay, well now I think I have this fabric, but who am I gonna find to do this, make this into a dress? And then my two running buddies that I ran with all the time, I'm talking to them and I'm telling them about my idea and they know all about it from the race. And, and, the, and one girl says to me, you know, after the race, I was talking to my parents and my parents know this man that works in a factory in New York City and he makes clothes. Do you want me to talk to him? And I was like, sure. And sure enough, I meet with this gentleman. He's been in the industry for 55 plus years. He's been making clothing for Diane von Furstenberg and Millie New York and all kinds of um, designer uh, companies and he takes me to lunch and he says sure I can do this it's a brilliant idea let's get started and literally that's what we did and he took my and he's still working for me today um, he's probably in his mid to late 70s he's an expert in production expert I and he has helped me make over I think 60,000 units in total since we started so it's amazing how things come to be so often, and you, you mentioned it earlier, that um, or, or a fashion brand will start because you find a need in your own life or maybe in your friend's life or whoever your muse might be. But often the story is more about sort of fashion or a trend, like you're looking for something to go to the club with and there's just not anything you can find. And this is a little different in the sense that it really is about a, a particular fit, mm -hmm. right? Um, was there an aha moment that when you touch the fabric beyond just the fact that it had a nice hand to it, that, hey, this actually fits women's lives in a way that might be different than anything else on the market? Or was that sort of secondary to, to the process? Um, no, it, it really was about my life at the time. And here I was, uh, a mom with school-age children, and I was a suburban gal. I, I was no longer that, you know, executive New Yorker that I loved that role that I played. I was, a, I was a suburban mom with kids that had a lot of events to go to, and I had nothing, I didn't know where to shop. I was sick of Banana Republic, sick of Ann Taylor, <laughs> certainly not the department stores. That wasn't something that I found interesting. And I always wanted to be unique and different, and that's another part of my whole story is I didn't have much, but what I did have was very different, and it, 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 it brought me a lot of attention in my life, and I liked that. My clothes sort of did tell my story. So, I, so it was about giving these, giving women, myself included, coming up with styles that were appropriate, because I do think that being appropriate in your situation is very important. You don't want to go to a PTA meeting in a ball gown. You'd feel <laughs> stupid, right? So we all know there's a level of appropriateness in our activities so I wanted to be the one that had a line of clothing that could uh, fill the, the needs of the suburban woman. And how, and how you do that is through the cut and the fit. And so that's what I did. I sort of set out to have it be modeled around me. Mm -hmm. And I'm five foot four and a half and I'm sort of an average build and that's, worked very well because that's also something that no one in our industry does. They, they typically fit things on women who are model, fit models who are 5'6", 5'7", 5'8", and consequently the average American woman is 5'4". So big, big, big thinking out of the box, not doing things the way the industry does it was, was really advantageous for us. From my, my brief experience at the company, um, just watching women who even might not think they like your brand, but then try it on, it, it's, it's kind of a fascinating experience to watch. Um, what, what do you think sort of is behind that? Because I think 
in many ways, your brand is very vibrant and bright. There's, there is a happiness to it. You, you love print. Um, that certainly comes from your interior design. Um, but I'm curious, why do you think women are so hesitant? I mean, I remember sitting in a, in a room with a bunch of women saying, oh, I could never wear that. I can't wear print. My shoulders are too big. My arms are saggy. My, my butt's too big. And then you just say, just try it on. <laughs> So isn't most things in life we're sort of afraid, we're conditioned to think one way or the other. And so most women of a certain age, you know, when you're young, you'll try lots of things. When you get to a certain age, whether you're in your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, you sort of think you know what you can wear and can't wear. And there are, there are women who tell other women that looks terrible on you. There are women who tell, men who tell women you can't wear that. And who, who's to say right or wrong? So a lot of, I, I find women get very conditioned very easily. And women aren't always very nice to each other for whatever the reasons are. But so I think women, and, and I also think it's very hard for women to shop today because, and even in the, like the 90s and the 2000s, the department stores had so many options, there were too many options. So we, so I think women just don't, kind of venture out of their comfort zone. So when we can get women to venture out and try it on, they can have an experience like nothing. And I think if you're all, if you're all in this business for I, probably the same reason is you wanna see yourself look beautiful or women or men look beautiful. Um, there's a little bit of, there's the communication again. You gotta kind of coax people into trying things. I mean, I remember the first season I came out, there was this six foot two, very large woman who, toppled over me and I get it like there's a lot of animosity between you know small women and large women and she said to me you know when I mean I was literally like a week into the business when are you going to make clothing for women my size and I said well I have it right now put on one of my dresses and she again she you didn't you're not making clothes for women my size I said I am and she, I said go in that fitting room and take this dress and go put it on now she could have killed me I mean she was huge and she's like it's never i said get in there just try it on and sure enough i fit her and another moment aha moment like she said you you did it again because the fabric has 20 percent spandex in it the prints do so much for bodies as you know if they're they have movement it moves the eye it's a, it can distract um it can attract so you know there's a lot of things you'll learn as you study what print color pattern can do and then fabric it, it, it sort of all works together and then even just the cut the detail it could be an eighth of an inch half an inch quarter of an inch it can make a big difference big difference so you're almost 10 years old the brand and um, how would you describe the brand you Caudalie now perhaps differently than when you started 10 years ago so with everything good success brings good headaches big <laughs> headaches big challenges so we we've you know, I, I basically looked at this like, I've got this thing aced, this is cake, okay, great. And then all of a sudden, you realize you don't. So growing and success takes capital. And you have to have money to continue to grow. And sure, there's profit, but if, if I go out and take a, another huge order, I have to have that cash flow coming in to make sure that I can make those goods. So sometimes it's, it's so much more challenging than I had ever thought because at the time I didn't really realize what I was getting myself into which has happened a lot in my life but again it's kind of fun seeing where it all unravels you never stop learning um, so a few people said to me in the beginning do you have a business plan I said absolutely not I'm not going to invest the time and energy putting a business plan together if I don't even have proof of concept if my concept doesn't work why waste all the time Okay, well now I know why they said you should have a business plan because here I am nine years in and I've stretched it as far as I can, but now I need to know where I go. So what I would say is I had organic growth that was really great and healthy, but I, you can't sustain a business with organic growth. And I think what I'm being told by the mentors that I've hired and um, people I'm bringing in in order to continue to grow and have a healthy business, you have to have a strategy. And that's where the numbers come in. And that's why it doesn't scare me because I know what the numbers can do for the business. So the fun was kind of, I had that fun. And my mentor says to me, well, you're in the adolescence phase. And what does that mean? Well, you've all been there. When you're a child, you know what that's like. When you're in adolescence, 
sometimes you want to be a kid again, and guess what else you want to do? Sometimes you want to be an adult, right? So sometimes you act like the adult, and then it doesn't feel so good, so what do you do? You revert back to being a kid. But you can't stay being a kid, so right, right now I'm sort of in that adolescent phase where like, what am I going to do? And I have to learn new skills so I can continue to grow as an organization. We often talk about how, especially in fashion, that these things do sort of grow organically and you were a salesperson, so I mean that stead you very well because you knew how to make a product and get it sold. Um, and that, that is a talent I think that, that a lot of people don't have. But ultimately you started to grow very quickly and had to hire people to kind of do things and like you said, you didn't have a business plan. Um, but, but that's a very typical sort of scenario with a fashion company, right? Um, what do you think sort of as knowing what you know now, what would have you have done differently 10 years ago other than the business plan? Hmm. So I think what you're saying is it's very entrepreneurial mm -hmm. to get to this stage. And the difference is corporations probably started out with an entrepreneurial idea way back when and, and then had people along the way who helped them become bigger and more successful. So what would I have done? Uh, I wished that I had put more thought into the people I hire, because the people you surround yourself with have such an incredible impact on how you feel every day. And I'm a super feeler, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a super energy person, and I'm an uplifter, and I love people. But, but that's one of the things that I wish I had invested more in is really watching who you surround yourself with. That is so true, and it sounds so cliche, but it really is so true. There's gonna be people in your life that you just don't understand why you don't feel good around them. Don't be around them, just don't. And there's nothing that says you can't or you should be because but if you can't shake them, then there probably is a reason why they're there. Mm -hmm. And I've learned something from everybody, whether I've liked them or not liked them, and I grew up a nice Catholic girl, like you had to like everybody, <laughs> but you really don't. <laughs> so you're polite and you're not rude, but, um, I think that the, the thing that I've had to accept is no matter what position you're in in life, you're going to serve someone. So you're either going to serve your boss or you're going to serve your employees, but you're never, you're, you will always serve someone or something. And so I, I don't really know what I would do differently. I probably would have had a business plan. <laughs> It helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would, I'd probably be sleeping a lot better if I had one, but... There is something about having rules, even if you decide to break them, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Boundaries, rules. It's, it is a good thing. Even you can break them. So as you're sort of building your team and, and one of the people that you brought in was talking um, sort of to your team about how it's amazing how a company has grown like yours so quickly and has managed to, to stay alive in such a disruptive mm. retail environment. Um, and that, that, that there's your proof of concept that the product is, um, even though it might be a niche product in the sense that this is maybe not everyone's cup of tea, but that there is an audience out there that resonates, that wants it, that engages with you. Um, I'm curious because I think there's a lot of labels that can be thrown at your brand and I know certain ones like Preppy you don't like, but how would you describe Jude Connolly today as a, as a brand and sort of what that, who that core customer is for you? Um, preppy gets, it has probably a bad rap. Uh, I don't really know what it means. I think it, it means pink and green to a lot of people. I think it Palm Beachy perhaps, but to me, uh, my brand, I, I don't want I don't like to wear clothes that are serious so and I also I feel like the brand itself has a youthfulness to it or it's ageless and I I hope that it connotates sort of effortless ease and comfort and happy and joyous and you know those are just adjectives but I think it's important that when you look at it or you touch it or you feel it or you buy it you have one of those emotions and that it could be just a, a navy pull on pair of pants but if you put it on and it's the right price and the woman looks at herself in the mirror and she loves it then great that's what i want and so one of the things i set out to do when i i did think this through was how do i build a brand that is memorable 
because if I have the greatest navy pant, that's great, but who's gonna know it's Jew Conley? So that was why color and print also worked really well in my favor. And my aesthetic towards the colors that I like and the prints that I like tend to be um, sort of associated with preppy. But I have a lot more I can do and make it a little probably more mainstream, but, the, but it was sort of tr strategic to pick the colors and the prints that I did because it did resonate with a consumer very quickly. So you see my product, people will know it's Jude Conley. And that's part of what the goal was, is to make it memorable so when women are wearing it, other women want to know what that is. So trick question, and then we're going to open it up. So your product, you, you said effortless, and it is in the sense that not only does it look good and fit well, but you can also throw it in the wash, <laughs> and it will last for a very long time. Right now, most brands, and I'll even include Gucci in this, are making clothes that are supposed to fall apart, that are supposed to become obsolete within a season or two. Um, so how do you think about that? Because in a, in a way, that's sort of where the fashion industry is going, and you're creating clothes that last forever. And, and in some ways, it makes it harder to keep building those cells because women still have eight or nine of these dresses in their closet. It's such a great question, and I was afraid he was going to ask me how I felt about sustainable clothing. Oh, no. <laughs> But um, it, so I think it's really important for me. I am not a gluttonous person. I don't have a lot of anything. I don't really, I have attachments to certain things, but I don't have a lot of those things. And that's how it was when I was a little, when I was young. I had some very nice clothes, but I didn't have a lot of them and they served me well. So I don't, I would rather sell more women a few dresses than a few women a lot of dresses. And that's sort of where I feel I have to keep doing more for the women that I do have because she's got 24 Duke Conley dresses. I have 50 Duke Conley dresses. I want to know what she's doing next. So I'm always her and I'm always trying to figure out what do I do next. So sure, I want a great crisp button down shirt that doesn't come out of my jeans when I'm wearing my jeans and a woven fabric does. So I did it in nylon spandex and it stays in and it looks crisp and it's clean and it doesn't wrinkle and I'm comfortable in it. So that's what I do. So I'm always trying to figure out what are the, what's the next um, category or classification of clothing I can do. But I'm also continually reinventing the prints and the colors with the styles. So there's an evolution on, on both ends, but I don't worry about the woman who has too much. It's okay, she can find something else. I'll just find the new woman. One other question that just kind of came out of that. I, I have noticed since working with you that you are not afraid to engage with women um, that are in their 50s and 60s and 70s. And so many fashion brands, I think, for whatever reason, don't want to be associated with age. And yet, I would say that women in their 50s are sort of, I mean, they have money. <laughs> They have businesses. We travel. Uh, they travel. <laughs> they have money. You know, all these things. And I'm just curious, um, you know, why you, you've talked a lot about women and making sure that you're serving them. Um, but why was that not sort of a tension? Because it is for so many fashion brands. They really want to be that 35-year-old brand or that 25-year-old brand. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, where you are in your life. I think it's your ego drives you, right? So a lot of women have said to me, why aren't you doing extra, extra large in your clothing? Because I also size everything extra small through extra large. It just keeps it simple. And I, the less labels I can put on women, the better they're going to feel about themselves. So people have said, why don't you do extra, extra large? And I tried it. And it's a hard market to do. And we've sold some. But I've had more people say to me, I wish you wouldn't do extra, extra large. And I find that very exclusive. So I don't, it, meaning it's excluding women. So we will continue to do extra, extra large because I think that the general population is getting larger and there's plenty of beautiful extra large women and larger women in this world as there are older women. And I'm the youngest of the baby boomer generation. And it's, this is the, we're the, we're the, probably the richest group of women in the country today. Mm -hmm. So Everyone else is serving you guys and Gen X's, so why not serve my lady? I don't need to dress every woman in America or in the world, but there's plenty of women that I can dress, so I can relate to her and I like her. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm comfortable in that arena. 
and you have such an interesting range of customers every everything from the hedge fund manager at you know spending ten thousand dollars a month on these dresses to to just a woman who this is this is her Valentine's dress or her Absolutely. special occasion. I want to open it up to questions. I want to make sure we have time for that. And Nicole, I'm going to have you grab that mic so that whoever is going to ask a question, you can pass it to. Who would like to go first? There we go, front row. Hi. Um, so my question is, on, on your website, you have the J Journal. Do you think that that helps your customer experience more? Like, do you think it makes your customers feel like you actually care? Oh, your blog, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I didn't grow up with blogging, and I don't like to read. I love to read, but I'd rather look at pictures than read. So I'm not a big blogger myself, but what I have found is there are so many women that love to read about it. And I think, what, what are the, what? I mean, there's a humility or a humbleness about me that serves me well, but then there's a, there's a, a responsibility I have to my customers who want to know more. So the blog has really helped get the story out and have women feel comfortable about who, who I am, what my likes and dislikes are, and, and they either like it and they delve into it more and then they may buy the product or they don't. But it really is another vehicle to tell the story with. And it's been a challenge for me because again, I think, what do I have to say? But apparently I have a lot to say because I haven't stopped talking. <laughs> so um, it's a great outlet and I highly recommend if you're into blogging, or you read blogs, keep doing it. Other questions? Right behind you. Hi. Uh, so with comfort and ease being one of the first priorities of your brand, um, what are some of the obstacles you've had to face with that? And I guess in terms of maybe with like fit or, uh, I don't know, just if, if, if any. Hmm, let me think about that. You know, one of the things is probably having, hiring the team that works with me, they don't always understand what comfort means to me. So they'll take, if I say to them, go and do this or meet with the tech designer or the pattern maker and make sure that it's really spot on comfortable. They might say, yeah, that length is good, but it could be an inch too long or an inch too short. And they put it and they, and we go into production on it. And then we put, we, we look at the production, I'll put it on and I'll say, my God, it's just an inch too short. This is not going to be comfortable for a woman who's going to church. So that's, again, it goes back to, it's the details that they say the, dev, the devil's in the details, it is. So those are some of the challenges that I'm finding. And one of the things I would highly recommend is wherever you work or whatever you do, you have to define your own glossary of what your definition is of whatever it is you're referring to. Because what comfort means to me is probably not what comfortable is to anyone else or what's easy. Right? So some women love wearing high heels and they can run in high heels. Uh, my ease and comfort to me are uh, running shoes. And I love the fact that I can find designer sneakers in every brand. And I have a lot of them because that's my passion, but they're comfortable and I like how they look. So that's a big part of it is making sure that you can communicate well with your team and there are always going to be challenges i mean to the smallest detail whether it's a collar or a button or a zipper if it's not comfortable it's coming off so you, you it's about training your team and, and and really working closely with them but that's always that's a challenge every day for me how do you, you. give up some of that control <laughs> <laughs> Um, a lot of, you know, a lot of faith and a lot of praying. And, um, I, I think one of the things that I've learned at this age is I, I can't do everything perfectly. 
as much as I want to, right? So, you know, you, you, I hit this thing out of the ballpark and women love the product and I'm on fire and I'm doing everything great. And then all of a sudden, mm, now I hit a bump and it's really bruised my ego and I sort of have to let go and I can't do it all. I could and I could do a lot, but I, I can't. And, and I think you, there's a point where you have to accept help. And, and I would say at 55, I'm finally asking for help. And one of the things I wasn't ever told to ask for help, that was a weakness. It's, it's not, it's just the opposite. You ask for help. And my mentor said to me, since you have such a hard time with asking for help, ask somebody you'd like their advice because it doesn't make you feel weak. And just, just that little question was so helpful to me or that statement was so helpful to me. So if you want help in school, ask for your professors, ask them for their advice. Who doesn't like giving advice to students, right? We all love, we all love that, but nobody really wants to ask for help, so. Yeah. That's a good point. Did you have another question? I think I. Um, no, I just, oh, okay. I yeah. <laughs> it just reminds me, actually, I just watched the, I think I said this to you, the Brene Brown, that, um, that the, you can only have courage if you're vulnerable, that those Completely. two things have to go together. Yep. And it's... Uh, yeah, and so I didn't really answer your question and how you let go is you have, there it is. I show vulnerability and that I don't know everything and I, and I really don't. And so I, you have to trust people. And, and then when you hire the wrong person because you were lazy, you didn't really look at their references, you just, you wanted to get somebody in because you wanted to get it off your back. And it inevitably, if you don't do the work and do the right, ask the right questions, it may work out, but it may not. And so there's a lot of trial and error in that, but there's also giving people the faith that they can do it and allowing them some mistakes is really comforting for me too now is I realize you, you, everything cannot be done in a day. Things take time. And so the more I trust my people and the more I let go, my business is gonna turn into something that I necessarily uh, it's not what I necessarily ha saw for it, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean it's wrong. So it's a hard thing to do, but I'm doing it. Just like my sons, they're like, mom, 22 and 25, let go. <laughs> so I have. But then they keep coming back. <laughs> they won't leave. <laughs> <laughs> Another qu do we have any other questions? Okay, we have two over here. Hello. Hi. Um, after opening your boutique in, and I don't know anything about your community, how small it is, it seemed like in, in your assumption it's a smaller community. Mm -hmm. um, it, for people, I'm thinking about maybe going back home and opening something in kind of a smaller, um, is that something that you would discourage? Or is that something that, because I feel like there's a need, but I, I don't know if, if it's a big enough market and how do you kind of know, you know, when there's maybe a spot for you or maybe you're going to jump in and it's just not going to be anything there for you. So uh, the best advice I could give you is sh there's always room for a brick and mortar, always. Whether you can make it successful or not is up to you. But there's, women are never going to, and men are never going to want to stop shopping and have an experience because I think that's what we're learning now is there could be you can buy anything on e-commerce even and that's an experience but you still want to touch and feel and see and interact and have that emotional exchange so I would highly recommend pursuing your your idea or what your gut's telling you but it may not be investing in a store because it may be too expensive for you but either a go for work for a company who you can work in the retail store, or go and look at your downtown and see what's there. Maybe there's a boutique that you like that you could go work for them. Um, we have a situation in our company where we have these two retail stores, and I know one of the gals that work for me has a dream of owning her own store. And I'm actually considering letting her oversee the retail stores. And I don't think she has any idea that everything she's done up until this point is going to uh, earn her the opportunity to run what I would say her own store, but it'll be ours. So explore it all. Walk into a store if you have a feel for it, go in and introduce yourself. You just never know. And I, I think you have to listen to your gut even more than your heart. Your gut has it all. And it'll tell you if you're in the right direction or the wrong direction, really listen to it. And you know, it, you can if, if, you, if you don't listen, you probably weren't supposed to, but Nine times out of 10, when my gut tells me something and I do it, I see why I should have. 
So pursue it. And it doesn't mean that it's the end no. thing. You'll probably have four more things after that. Right? The path is this way. <laughs> you know, if you look at Feng Shui and you read what Feng Shui says about even the path into the, the walkway into your home, right? A sidewalk in, or steps into your home. The, the best thing is a curvy pathway. That's the healthiest Feng Shui. The energy loves to move on a curve. And anyone, you can, you can look that up, you can challenge it. But I read that and I found that interesting. So now every time I drive by a house, I'm very linear and I like symmetry. <laughs> but thankfully the house I live in has a nice curvaceous um, path to my front door. So keep that in mind. We had one other question, yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, do you design your prints? Can you say that again? Do you design your prints you know, for the dress? Um, mm -hmm. I do not, mm -hmm. but we have people who do. So we get inspiration. We don't, so actually a few of them have come from nothing, mm -hmm. and, but most of them will come. There's, there's print designers out there that we can go to the market, we can buy prints, mm -hmm. and then we recolor them mm -hmm. or we'll change them. So that's a really interesting process in and of itself. We do have some that we do create and design on our own, and it's a, a young gal we hired from SCAD, um, and she studied textiles. But I don't believe we have to do everything from scratch. Yeah. Because there's so many beautiful prints out there that, um, that can be translated into clothing that if I had to change it, it wouldn't be as beautiful. But I would use an Hermes print for, for inspiration, and Hermes is one of my favorite brands. I just, everything they do, I love, whether it's their colors or their, their the print detail. Um, but we take inspiration from it and then we sort of make it our own. And you put it on that fabric, which I think is surprising to people. So that's sort of the surprise of seeing a traditional print. Mm -hmm. she, just, she did a whole menswear print for fall 2019 that's coming out. And it's all your typical men's prints, but on this on this uh, fabric. Yeah. So that's the thing. Anything can be translated. You can do things like like men's shirts and woven fabrics and houndstooths and um, um, Glen plaids. All those traditional sort of menswear patterns can be translated onto this fabrication, and so you have this look of a menswear uh, dress or suit, but it's in this fabrication, so you can do anything in it. And that's what I like to do. I, I tell my kids I'm going to be doing a cartwheel on the front, front lawn when I'm 100. And hopefully I'll be wearing a Jukonli <laughs> skirt. But um, that, that's sort of the energy around the whole brand is like you can do anything in it. And anything can be translated into this fabric. We have time for one more question. Okay, so I'm going to do it then. Okay. <laughs> so we have a room full of a lot of designers and we sort of end with this with, with each speaker. But what sort of advice would you give them as they're thinking, and maybe not specifically around design or even sort of school, but just maybe life advice in terms of, of you know, connecting to a passion, connecting to product, connecting co to consumers? Um, what advice might you have in terms of how they might think about that as they get into their careers? Hmm. Um, I think so much of what you have to do is be kind to yourselves, be realistic, don't set your expectations, don't, don't try to be the next Tom Ford. If you're meant to be Tom Ford, you'll be Tom Ford or you'll be, you know, Susie Smith. But work hard and have fun doing it and give more of yourself than you're trying to take. I, I think that's just in life in general is is, is give of yourself. And if you do that, you're gonna get it back tenfold, no matter what you're doing. And don't give up in design because there's new things being born every day. You're, you're at such a time in, your, in, in this world, there's a new, a new earth is being made every day. So you guys can be a big part of this. You don't know if you're sitting next to the next Tom Ford. You don't know, or you may be that, that person yourself. So hard work, never say no, always say yes. And um, sort of keep exploring. And keep it light. Don't be hard on yourselves. Don't. Because <laughs> that's, it won't serve you well. And there's plenty of gold stars for everybody and you'll find them along your path. They just may not come from where you expect. 
So and that's what I'll close on. When I graduated from high school, you know, everyone had your senior superlative, and it said, "Where are you, where are you going to be as an adult?" And I said, "I'm, I'm going to be living in New York City in my personally decorated uh, condo, driving a light blue Corvette, and an Afghan hound." Now, I don't know if you know what either of those two things are, but I don't drive a light blue Corvette. I have a navy blue, very large Range Rover, and I don't have an Afghan hound. I have a Jack Russell Terrier. So the path is very windy. It isn't, I, I still, and I have what I, that is what I wanted. I have it today, but it didn't come in the way I thought it would. So life is meant to be fun but it's not without its challenges. So that's why I say don't be hard on yourselves. Be easy and enjoy it. And that's Jack-Jack on the little gift. So yes, you... that's my dog <laughs> on the key. And this, so the wristlet, so that too. Fun little thing, throw it out if you don't like it, but enjoy it. I, if you guys don't like it, your moms might. But what I found is that was um, out of, a, I created that from an Hermes bracelet that I have, that I love, and it's a scarf bracelet and it's a real pain to put on, but I love the idea of a scarf bracelet. So what, what I did was I made it practical and I put a key ring on it. And now all these moms love it and women love it because you can, this is a really fun thing for women. You can find it when it's in your bag. We have a ton of stuff in our bag, right? So you put your hand in and you're trying to find your keys. You'll find that. <laughs> so that's helpful if you're driving and you're looking for your keys and you can wash it. And um, I like it when I ride my bike so I can put my keys and my wristlet on and I can ride my bike and do what I got to do. So hopefully it's helpful. Thank you so much, Jude, for coming. It was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, thank it was you. So much fun. Good <laughs> luck, you guys. Enjoy your life. Thanks for having me.